On this week's podcast, we are joined by Lachlan Story, a conservation biologist turned permaculture advocate. He conducted groundbreaking research on a fungus that affects green and golden bell frogs before discovering his true passion for sustainability. Frustrated by the lack of environmental job opportunities, he co-founded Tree Frog Permaculture. Now, as its sole owner, Lachlan's vision includes creating an educational hub focused on organic food cultivation and sustainable living. His expertise covers plant and weed identification, animal identification, and ecological consulting. Join us as we explore Lachlan's journey and his commitment to a greener future. Hey guys, and welcome to the podcast today. Today we're talking with Lachlan Story. Lachlan's based in the Newcastle region in New South Wales, Australia. So Lockie, tell us a bit about yourself, mate. Hello, everybody. Um... My name is Lachlan Story. I run a small business called Tree Frog Permaculture and um, been about 13, 14 years now. And I sort of consult, design, educate and implement permaculture systems and all sorts of related things um, through the area. Uh, and basically, I started in, uh, in science, um, was heading into biotech. Uh, and then I realized I'd be stuck in a lab pipetting for the rest of my life. And I saw insanity on the horizon and I decided I couldn't do that. So I needed to do something a little more uh, direct for sustainability um, and the environment. So I ended up doing some post-grad research with the Green and Golden Bell Frog because um, biology and ecology was what I ended up with in, in uh, education. And then, uh, then I decided, uh, because the funding was coming from iffy places and, again, stuck in a lab, uh, and huge amount of writing on a computer, crazy town, I would go and make frog ponds for people. Um, and then that turned into permaculture when I found the permaculture philosophy because that, that touches on everything under the sun, basically, um, as far as systems approach to sustainability and, um, and if you want to use the term, off-grid living, yeah. Yeah. But to, to tell us more about it. So, so what was it that really attracted you to that permaculture philosophy? Um, I think like we tend to get very bogged down in given elements um, in society. Uh, and, and the permaculture philosophy, it, 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 it's a holistic one. So uh, if you know what I mean by holistic, it's, it, it takes every bit of new information um, and, and existing information out there um, and it collates it into uh, into a system of approach where basically it guides you into doing the most like sustainable thing with the information you've got at the time. And it's about like learning how to um, set up systems that work more with nature than against them. And um, and that applies from, you know, growing our food all the way through to like getting our energy supply, housing, um, social connection, uh, every everything you can think of, basically. Um, of course, a lot of my my realms in the garden world and food production and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but um, basically, like it's it's so much about um, creating the appropriate healthy ecosystems that are then supporting our lives and the food systems we're using to grow our food. And the industrial agriculture system is tragically uh, damaging in its current state. Um, and how we treat water as probably the world's most precious resource, fresh water. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a bit sad. Yeah. So we, we need to do better. And, and this is it's one of the, I found permaculture is just one of the best all round um, holistic approaches and philosophies around all of this stuff. And yeah. just like energy conservation approach, yeah, yeah. That's it. So for, for me, like when when I did my permaculture course, I did my PDC with Jeff Lawton. I did my online course mm. with Jeff, and then um, decided I really want to go to a face to face one. Did end up doing the face to face one, and one of the the, the biggest thing that hit home for me because I come from an energy background. That's what I was all about. Was this and permaculture is an energy audit. It's just that simple, and it's about. You know, mm. using less energy to get more out of a system, but then also using that same amount of energy to get more done. Um, so, yeah, that for me was the biggest thing I took about it and went back and applied that to, you know, I already been applying it to everything in my life, but I really focused mm. on that. Yeah, did a whole big energy audit and everything I was doing. And, um, yeah, that, that was a game changer for me after on a PDC, that, that one thing. So, 
Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I recommend it. Um, for I mean, they should be teaching them at school, <laughs> quite honestly. Yeah. This is like handy stuff across the board, yeah. Totally. We, we, we did um on the weekend, so we had a – last week was a huge big week for us. Um, road trip to Sydney for a wedding, back up the coast, and literally got home Friday – and then took the kids to a permaculture, a kids permaculture weekend. Um, and, you know, it was thinking, you know, it was four days, half a day Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then half a day Monday. And we didn't stick around Monday because the kids had, they, they wanted to go home, you know, go see mum. <laughs> so, <were> um, <laughs> yeah. But we, for me, what was really interesting, we sat around Monday night and I said to the kids and asked them some questions about, you know, what was it they got out of it from the weekend? And I was actually so surprised of how much my kids remembered, like, you know, my son would be labelled with that name ADHD, just like his dad. You know, um, and he got so much out of it. And he, one of the biggest things that when he's the first thing he said was, "Dad, you know, I learned so much on the weekend about you know just any you know kids in their toilet talk is like you know even poo poo can give things other life. You know, they they take your poo and they compost it and put it in the garden and it gives something else another life and creates something else. You know, it was just so amazing to hear him say that and what we got out of it. So yeah, it was a for me, it was definitely um, it was a few things I was pretty embarrassed about, to be honest. You know, like you know that he didn't know. <laughs> I'm like, I'm you you haven't guy. instilled, you <laughs> haven't instilled the wonders of poo in your children, Mike. <laughs> I know, I know. But come um, on, but it, that's the first thing you do. Too. Yeah, but they, they were so engaged <laughs> the whole time and really into it, and they're just seeing how much they learnt from it. You know, it was just amazing. You know, so and we, we, we you know. It probably we're in a couple of months now, but we, we cut our kids off from technology. We're like, nah, no more. And uh, it's been a game changer. And like, yeah, it's seeing them that whole weekend really engaged. I think I think if we wouldn't have done the trip to Sydney and I've been dro- dro- so much driving around, they probably would have mm. made that last mm. half a day, you know, um, for the thing. But it's been a big couple of weeks for them. So, but yeah, I'm definitely same thing. I think the school system is broken, and we want to implement more things like that in our education process to help kids out. You know, so yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, um, schools are, are starting to come through, I think, at least from what I've seen in the last 10, 5, 10 years, um, or at least some schools, it's it's obviously school to school basis, but um, yep. I've had some schools hitting me up about sort of composting systems and, and like some of those sustainable growing workshops and things like that. Yep. Um, the insect hotels are a really popular one, <laughs> yeah. Um, which I'm always I'm always for because uh, biodiversity is like uh, it's one is very interesting, but it's really really important, and we're losing it so quick. Yeah, um, no. it's going to be a bit of a boring world with just pigeons and rats, you know. Yep. No, definitely. Yeah, I think as tasty um, as they are. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. It's um, but I think the. The success I've seen with schools over the years, I think if you get that real champion in a school that like an admin or a teacher or a principal, someone that really wants mm. to do it. Like we we done a couple of projects with schools in Sydney where we did some um aquaponic shipping containers and we did some gardens, some chickens and things like that. So uh, but we had a principal there that he was a permaculture champion, he loved it, he'd done a course and he really wanted to instill that in the children. I think I think it's like anything like that leadership, you know, that we really require to get people on board with. And I think yeah, the schools that really take that on, like, I was amazed with how engaged the kids were, you know, that we had in those mm. classes through the school. So, yeah, it's good fun. Yeah, they love it. Um, I, 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 I swear, like, I mean, I remember being uh, quite hard at attention <laughs> uh, in some of these classes, but as soon as it comes to, like, uh, getting outside and, I mean, most kids are just, they just want to go out half the time, yeah. right? So it's like if you if you start taking them to the places they want to go and like and just the amazement of like looking under a log and then and then hearing about what exactly they're seeing and how it plays a role in the nutrient cycling systems of the environment and how we yeah. could apply that in our own gardens and 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 like food growing systems yeah. i just find that stuff really cool yeah and so important no. Yeah, so even even as just like a ramp into that um, that mode of thinking, you know, it's like it's such an important uh, thing to touch on in these in these places. So, yep, yeah, that's it. Well, yes, yeah, so, so to me, like you know, the way I think about permaculture, and I suppose what really I love about it, it's it's you know, it's all a design system, isn't it? So if you can just, it's that mentality mm. and look at how to solve problems, and you know, it's the I remember that the, one of the last things we said when we did our P, PDC, and I think if I can get this right, was um, I think it's the, the um, 
the solution is always at the core of the problem or something like that, you know? Um, yeah. So the, the solution was always a part of the problem in the first place. So um, having that thinking, I think it's one of the biggest things with permaculture. It's just a mindset, a, a thought process and design. If we can design our lives a lot better, we you know have a better experience in life. Yeah. If you, um, if you, yeah, I've always liked that when you, you see a problem, I try to teach. So you go, all right, that might be a problem right now, but if you look at it, it's, it's actually telling you something. So in the world of plants, you know, uh, oh, my, my cabbage is covered in aphids. What's happening? I'm a bad gardener. Like, no, you just have to think, okay, the aphids, they're telling you something that something's out of balance in the system. So yeah. you can sort of go, all right, well, uh, if the plant is stressed in some way, it doesn't have as many defenses up to to uh, make its sap a little more bitter for the aphids so they're not as hungry for it. Because like any of these animals, they're looking for an easy meal, right? And so the more of them are there, the easier that meal is likely to be. And that's why they're gathering. Um, and so, yeah, you can just, you're using this logical system to figure out the core of the issue and then, okay, oh, my cabbage might not be getting enough water or I'm giving it too much. Or So by seeing that problem, instead of just going, oh, I have to treat the problem outright, you treat it at the core and then you're going to have better cabbage and less pest problems. Yep. No, <laughs> yeah, totally. I just, that applies across the board, yeah. But I use yeah. a lot of garden examples, obviously. No, yeah. yeah. No, totally. So, mm. mate, you're you're in a um, you're based in an ur urban environment. So, tell us more about the, the challenges mm. of doing this stuff in an urban environment. Because a lot of people that, you know, especially what I do in my business, most people are off grid. They're buying big properties and going remote and rural. But I'm actually the completely opposite. All my customers, I'm completely off grid in the middle of town, and <laughs> I love it. I, I love the challenge of yeah. a small property. Um, yeah. I've got some. Yeah, I think the, we had a real estate agent the other day because we're thinking about selling, and um. He come out and then he, two days later he called me up and said, mate, I just want to tell you, that is the biggest solar system I've ever seen on a residential <laughs> property ever. And I was like, mate, it's only 145 square meter house. And like, we've got a 25 kilowatt system up and like literally it's big. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I like this. Can you, you so can't see the thing, roof. <laughs> no, you can't. Like, I, my, my thing, yeah. th this is my thing, you know, like I actually feel you're being unfair to corrugated iron, like it shouldn't be sunburnt. Um, that stuff shouldn't live in the sun, you know, for all its life. So I like to protect it and coat it with no. solar panels. So my attitude with solar yeah. panels is, you know, fill your roof and cover your roof, but protect your corrugated iron, you know, with tiles or whatever. So um, that, that's how I size the solar system, mate, to fill the roof. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, and look, when they when they finally get on top of solar paint um, and things like that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for it. Yeah. yeah. As, if we can get as much solar coverage, I mean, Apart from the fact that like we're, we're using the space uh, for energy generation, it's like maybe it will take a bit of the heat out of the equation as well if we're converting it really well to like energy and then we're saving on cooling bills in our in our summer and that sort of thing. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's multiple applications there. Can't wait for the yeah. new tech, but mm, totally. take it all, take it all. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. So, so, so from a, a permaculture designer point of view, if someone's in an urban environment, like where do you recommend they should start or some things that people could do in that urban environment mm. to make the biggest impact? Yeah. So I, I like, honestly, uh, try just start somewhere small. Um, even if you've got a lot of space and, and quite honestly, not everybody and a fair few people, most people don't have access to that space. And with the current, uh, cost of property and things like that there's less people that are able to reach that sort of thing um so you can you can as you're saying get off grid um in a suburban area and you just have to be smart about it so um again you as far as like say growing food um you are to a point limited by the space that you have available um but there's an enormous amount you can do to uh increase especially with permaculture, increase the um, the availability of, of cropping space. So you can go up walls. Using vertical space is really good. Plenty of vines produce a lot of food and they require something to climb on anyway. So um, any fences, and man, there are plenty of fences in suburbia. <laughs> yeah. Color bond is, uh, is thick and fast out here. Um, so, and, and color bond, um, I mean, you, you were saying you like, uh, protecting your, your sheet metal. Um, I'm like, 
hey, that stuff is over-engineered for a fence. You should grow something <laughs> on it. <laughs> That's crazy over-engineered for a fence. So um, well, engineered if you can put a trellis up. up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You could do a green wall off half of these things and you wouldn't be, it wouldn't blink, you know? So, um, yeah. 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 So green walls, uh, aquaponic systems are super cool. If you've like, if you just have a whole lot of hard surfacing um, and, and sometimes you just can't really, uh, you can't really choose what's available <laughs> to you because the people that came before you might've had like six caravans and uh for some reason just like hoarding caravans <laughs> and they just like cemented their entire uh backyard and you're like well this is six foot thick i don't know what they buried in there i'm not going to question it but um, i'm just going to go on top <laughs> um and so yeah some things like you know converting your ibcs i'm sure people know what they are um international bulk containers um yep. to aquaponic systems where you can grow like fish and veggies in like a closed loop um that's very cool and you don't necessarily need uh open soil for that so yep. you know for adapting to like uh, uh industrial if you've got like soil toxicity problems that's also excellent um because you know you're you're not touching the soil this is a, a separated system um and also wicking beds so like where i am i've got a um a really wide an abnormally wide driveway and a long driveway and so like you can fit almost fit two cars side to side on it but not quiet and so um i've basically converted some some uh, bathtubs into wicking beds um and they don't require soil like ground soil you they're basically like a large wicking pot but you can grow separate to the ground in that um and that can just sit on cement or pavers or whatever um and so you're making available cropping space in a place which definitely wouldn't be a growing space otherwise so there's, yeah. there's tons of tricks like that um but yeah, you shouldn't you shouldn't even let like um being in an apartment with a with a balcony stop you at least do something yeah, yeah. um even even a little bit is worth is worth something yeah yeah you shouldn't no, let totally a little bit stop you doing uh something at all yeah no definitely so maybe with yeah. The, yeah, with the aquaponics, I'd like to delve more into that mm. there. And I, I've, you know, there's a project you did with a swimming pool because we, we've done a couple of natural swimming <laughs> pools. We had a couple of customers natural swimming pools, and for mm. us, the natural swimming pool is amazing because it's so energy efficient. Because that's all I care about, you know, when it yeah. comes to designing the off grid price properties and doing the energy um, audit. But it's they're so energy efficient. So. Mate, mm. I'll, just brought your website up here. So so tell us more about this project here using the. The, the IBCs with the swimming pool and yeah, making mm. a, a natural swimming pool and how, how it works. Tell us more about it. Yeah. So well, this was, this is a, um, a family down Martinsville way. Um, and, and the, the guy there, he's, um, he's so, so keen and so brave when it comes to just trying these new things out. So um, the way this one's set up, this was, this was built from scratch. Um, and so basically you got the, the shell pool, and um it's it's using bubble bubble lifts um which is like a, a really low energy way of shifting water around um and so it actually uses just an air compressor and um running tubes to to air stones and the bubbles in the bottom of a pipe that's um full of water actually create lift by um friction with the bubbles against the water and so the, it drags water with it and so instead of running like a pool pump like an active pump which is quite energy expensive you can just use a, a single air compressor and that the power of that can shift all of this water basically from the main pool volume through uh these ibc um grow beds and so this is sort of still in early days um at the moment and so Generally, like from from this experience, I would probably recommend like if you're setting something like this up, you'd want to go for something that had like you've set the plants to grow up to as close to maturity as possible before you start running the system in completion or start using the system because you start using the, the pool and like the nutrient load starts increasing because of what comes off us. Yeah. Um, and so the whole idea with a natural pool, instead of using like um, 
you know, and you, you know this, but for the listeners, um, you know, instead of using like, you know, salt and chlorine to kill off um, all the stuff that wants to grow on the available nutrient, you're actually trying to strip the nutrient load away from the water with as much plant growth as possible before it cycles back to the pool volume. Now, I, I personally prefer um, the idea of having like some integrated grow spaces within a pool, um, but I'm more of a person that doesn't mind swimming swimming with fish and other organisms and having plants brush against me and things like that. But that's, that's harder for people to... Uh, to get a taste for, I think, when they've they've grown up with these very sterile water bodies. Um, whereas I, I I used to swim in rivers and stuff. It's like more my my bag. Um, yep. <laughs> you never know if there's an eel coming around your 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 calf or whatever. You know, it's, it's a little bit freaky, but it's also part of the fun. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I yes, the idea is. Um, Basically, this water is cycling past the roots of these plants and there's substrate these plants are growing in. And so the plants can't take up sort of the dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus and stuff straight up. There needs to be a bacteria doing the, the nutrient. Um, there's an, a ch change between type of nitrogen, nitrates, nitrites, because nitrites, nitrates, I believe. And then, um, and then the plants can actually use it as a growth nutrient. So the bacteria are actually an integral part of that system because um, the plants wouldn't just be able to take the the nutrients straight out of the water without that conversion process. Yeah. Yeah. Does that all make sense? Yep. Do you think? Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I not, mean, it's I it's actually it. like simpler than it sounds, really. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's about making sure that you've got more plants um, than you would require so um because you to to stop algae so like algae is one of the things that's like it's such a natural part of a water ecosystem right so yeah. and that's one of the things that throws people off they're like my pool's going green oh my god i can't touch it and like well if it's blue green then i'd worry about it <laughs> that's poisonous but um the idea is like algae is really quick to take nutrient load and a lot of it's like phosphorus load is really important for for string algae is a big one for these things uh, i'm sure everyone's seen string algae before sort of um filamentous stuff floating through the water grabbing onto surfaces yep. um and its main growth um nutrient is phosphorus and so if you keep the phosphorus for example stripped as far down as possible in the water as in close to zero then you're limiting the building blocks for that algae growth and then you're ending up with much clearer, um, cleaner water. So, um, and so, making sure that there's more plants, that you want the plants to be hungry all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Seems a bit no, mean, no. doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Credit <laughs> mean, keep me keen, mate, you know. That's right. Yeah, yeah. keen for that nutrient. That's what you're trying to do. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so, yeah. so if someone's got a natural swimming pool and they're getting the algae, more, they want more plants, to basically help that's usually that. how it goes yeah and honestly like um i think there's a little bit of like psychology uh around this as well in that like as a natural swimming pool you have to accept that there's going to be a little more natural life yeah. <laughs> um yeah. and a little bit of algae is probably just going to be around you know like um it's nothing to be afraid of uh, again as long as it's not blue green algae but you know if you've yeah. got that there's other problems um so uh you know a little a little bit of algae is like it's almost inescapable in this sort of system but if you've got an enormous amount of it like i was saying before that's a problem that you can be like ah what's that telling me i need more plants um because they're obviously not stripping enough nutrient out and then you have to think think okay well i've got so many plants and so much filter bed going on what else is happening here what water is entering the system and what's in that water already so if you're topping up your swimming pool uh via your roof um and there's birds pooping on your roof then that's a nutrient income and that nutrient is then potentially if, it, if it's like a, a fair bit of it in a flush then you're going to have um an expansion basically yeah. of um that nutrient it's going to be a boom yeah and so the, the more plants you've got, the more flexibility you've got for that nutrient to be taken taken up. 
uh, yeah, the, the whole idea with your natural pools is, um, you know, you, you shouldn't, you should try to avoid expecting it to be completely devoid of life because that's not the point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there is a reason it's a natural pool and it's, it's, it's a living thing. So um, it's just about balances. And so you're, you're trying to keep the balance um, in your natural pool shifted towards nutrient extraction. Um, which is why your plants need to be like in full swing as, as much as possible because that's when they're going to be taking as much of that nutrient load out of the water and doing the filtering for you. Um, and yeah, keeping that, um, that nutrient low means you're going to have less algae bloom and, and other sort of eutrophication, which is the, the darkening of the water for various reasons. Yeah. 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 It's, um, mm. I think it's hard for people to, I, I know for me, it's a challenge to, watch nature and let nature do its thing and sort things out and people just want to interact and get involved and you know i think yeah. sometimes better left alone it, you know it, it'll sort itself out you know <laughs> yeah that's right and and the thing is like with a living system like these things mature and so um you can't expect like a natural swimming pool to or even a pond you know to look um beautifully clear and vigorous in the first you know a couple of months after installation yeah because it takes time for these bacteria to get a good like um, yeah. population going. Uh, plants take time to establish and get into full like um, biological swing, you know, all this stuff. Um, yep. Same with gardens, you know, you can't expect a garden to produce uh, straight away. It's just going to get better and better and better. Yeah. Over yep. time. That's so yeah. true. Like, yeah, like um, our aquaponics, we, 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 it's moved three times in its life. And um, <laughs> It's quite well traveled. Oh, yeah, well, that's since I've owned it, you know, and then it was the guy before that that built it. Um, but to yeah. me, I feel like getting rid of that water in the moment is like, if only I could bottle that, and take that ton of water with me next winter, and you know, because it is, it's like you just build. It's funny, we have bags of soil here. We've been in Lismore for six years now, and I have bags of soil that I had all my. Um, plants in that I still have to pot them out from, from Sydney. So we've been here six years. So we've still got bags of soil we brought with us from Sydney. So Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's just been senescing in bags still, has it? <laughs> yeah. I wonder how good it is now. I know. I know. <laughs> Might be all we're, right. We're, yeah. I know. Yeah. So I mean, Whatever's in it, it'll be happier if it's out of the bags, I'm sure. I know. Eventually. I know. Yeah. No, it's one, one, of, it's those one of those things. To deal with so um yeah there's no so no funny. end of things to do i get that yeah no. <laughs> That's it. i have similar stuff yeah yeah so mate mm. with um like you've done so many different projects in permaculture and that's sort of the mm. sort of vari variety of things if you were to pick one thing like like for me i design solar systems uh, off-grid power stations that's what i do but my favorite thing is actually helping people design houses um, and, and community, that's sort of one of my things. So what's your favourite thing with all the things you know and do to do in a permaculture realm? It's hard to pick in some ways, but I think the thing I keep coming back to is um, food forests. Um, yeah, okay. I just, like, it's just such an excellent integrated way to grow food, and it's one of the ways that's, like, the most resilient as well. So I just think, like, we... If we don't do something about how we're uh, getting a lot of our food supply, um, we need to like decentralize to a point. Like we can't keep sh trucking stuff tons of kilometers. Um, for it, it's, it doesn't even lend itself to like good produce in the end because we're selecting food for like transportability, freezeability, yeah. um, yeah. non-bruising rather than flavor, nutrition you know diversity all that stuff so yeah the yeah. beauty of your food forest thing is like you can grow all of these different things um so again you're hedging your bets right you don't have all your eggs in one basket you're not just growing like a whole field of oranges all of the same type that are like genetically identical because they're grafted yeah. and then you get a, a disease come in and there's no genetic potential there to like evolve an adaption to it um like get a resistance so it's like the more diversity we can encourage in these systems the better um and it means less work for us right because we're setting yeah. up this like this productive system which is it's it's helping itself it's like supporting its own needs and then it's doing extra on top for you to take 
And so you can put a little bit in and get a little bit extra out, um, but you don't have to do a lot at all. And I mean, like Jeff Lawton's stuff is like some of the stuff that really got me going on this and I've just sort of run with it. Um, yep. And I just think like urban food forests um, would be such a smart move for a lot of councils to like get into. Um, totally. It's an interesting one in the management of it with community, but like it's not an impossible task. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, it's, and so go on it's funny about the transport you're saying the weekend like so because the kids went and did the it was actually at jeff's place we went and hammered his food forest on the weekend we the kids did a, a yeah. tour of a food forest and it got me thinking on the weekend about transport i was like i wonder how many people in the world have never tasted mulberries so because you can't transport yeah. them in, in the yeah because they, they just don't everywhere. they're no good after a, a day or two off the plant you know yeah, yeah. And it's uh, like for us, I me, start making kids, wine. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So um, I ferment readily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then for us, you know, like we, we ride them because we live in an urban environment. We we go around and on, on the way to the kids' school, we ride the bikes to school. There's a, a mulberry tree. And I'm like, yeah, on the way home, not the way to school, kids will ride that. Um, yeah. So it's just one of those things I think about. It's like, yeah, because it doesn't transport. And I think and of how many of those, because for us, for my kids, you know, they've seen a platypus, they've seen koalas. And I, th I think about this sort of stuff like, how many people around the world haven't experienced these amazing things? Um, That's crazy. Yeah, they come from the supermarket, and yeah, it's, it's like um, I think it's called a sumo mandarin. Um, my brother-in-law has introduced; they're buying that from the supermarket in Sydney now. We're down there, and um, yeah, it's a pretty popular mandarin because it's got no seeds in it, uh, and it's oh. you know it's not nice and smooth. It's sort of got rough skin, but the kids loved it. You know, like it was a. Um, yeah interesting things like that that yeah people have probably never tried before so um mm. but yeah i think i mean food forests yeah we uh i think we tap into like the i think it, uh, hopefully it's increased slightly but the old um the old data is we in the western culture we tap into about two percent of the world's food stuff yeah um which is drastically boring in my book <laughs> I mean, like, I, I love diversity and, and I like to eat seasonally if possible because, like, you, you're more excited about the things that come around each season yeah. because you just don't have them available all year round. Yeah. Um, and it's also a good, like, nutritionally, I think. Um, yeah. But, yeah, so, so you know, with your food forests, you can, coming back to that, you can grow the widest variety of things that are suitable for your area in if you set them out in the right design, um, and you've got the things that are hardier to sun and wind on the outside and to, you know, the really harsh sun uh, handling ones to the west that protect the things to the east. This is in the southern hemisphere. Um, and, you know, that's there's there's an extra sort of uh, habitat there for beneficial insects and other beneficial predators. Um, there's distraction for pests. So, like, they don't have an easy time of finding the things they really want straight away. And in the time they're taking to find what they want to lay their eggs on or eat, they're like, the longer it takes for them to do that, there's like more chance for them to be eaten by a beneficial predator or something like that. And so it's just such a fantastic approach to an integrated food growing system. Um, and then you don't need to be using so many of your like, well, any of your pesticides. Um, you don't need to be fertilizing as much, especially if you integrate like an animal uh, element to it um like chickens are a great one as long as they're not constantly in there maybe <laughs> um <laughs> till, till it's a really advanced forest yeah. perhaps yeah. but yeah young young forest doesn't need uh, persistent chicken access necessarily no. or you'll no. end up with nothing in your understory <laughs> <laughs> um much like humans they eat themselves out of house and home they need restrictions placed upon their browsing uh yeah yeah so yeah, it's no, just such a such a cool thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for someone listening at home, like, how do you think we could get more food forests in urban environments? So, like, to me, the reason I love the challenge of helping people in an urban environment, even though like ninety five percent of the work I do is all rural, off grid, middle of nowhere, five hour drive to a property. Um, you know, I, I love the urban. So, like, how do you think someone listening at home or recommendations of how to get more of these food for us in an urban environment or get council to put more of these things in like what would you how do you think we make well that um so i think it depends on where you are so i mean um i'm in newcastle and it's um it's 
historically highly industrial (laughs) and so we have some issues with uh lead and various other contaminants in our soil in a lot of spots especially near the rail line where a lot of coal comes through or has done um and so your a lot of your fruit trees are actually pretty okay for like um, a bit of lead contamination in the soil because it doesn't actually transmit to the fruit so much um it it stores and so i mean you can use a lot of these things for phytoremediation as well so they're like absorbing some of these heavy metals and storing them in biomass which you're not eating um and which is sort of cleaning up your soil over time um but basically like uh with with the industrial things like that places like that um there's a lot of these old industrial parks and stuff which may have fallen into disuse um and so they are one option for this sort of thing of course the right soil testing and stuff needs to be done in that instance um i'm a i'm a big fan of uh you know it's it's hard to inc- a lot of places haven't incorporated quite enough green space um in their development over the years and so um this is where it gets a bit tricky but there are places like flood flood plains and flood zones that have been too difficult to develop as well. Yeah. And um, trees and natural systems actually handle uh, periodic inundation far better than human built infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, they use the water and the nutrient load in it. So um, if it's designed well, uh, you know, you can combine some food forestry in some of these places where building isn't necessarily a smart idea anyway. Um, and they're, they're far more like they're better at retaining soil and, and preventing erosion in these high water events. Um, they'll, you know, they'll store a lot of that water in biomass, which is a, a really beneficial way to maintain more water on the land as well um and then of course you're you're producing food close to where people live and so duh good idea um but yeah so i mean i i actually live in lambton which has an enormous amount of uh park uh of all of the places in newcastle there's a lot of park here they're all in one place and it's a lot of sporting fields and sport has its place great (laughs) but that's a lot of sporting fields and um Excuse me. A lot of, a lot of that land actually used to be market gardens. Um, about fifty years ago, I have a um, an older lady living next to me here, and she she was here for that time. Um, and so it's all really lovely arable land, but it's it's floodplain basically down yeah. here, um, because there's sort of a, a what you what used to be a creek running through the bottom the bottom part, which is now concrete lined and called a stormwater drain. Yeah. um much much to much to the wildlife's distress um but you know I, I understand why they did that originally but they're starting to sort of uh shift their take on that a little bit but you know if we if we maybe um you know a, a, a starting food forest could just be one one field you know and there's like there's like seven eight fields there and they're huge <laughs> so it's like you know uh there's there's all sorts of space that's just not necessarily used and it's just dedicated to massive amounts of lawn and grass which takes um you know fuel to maintain with machines and all that stuff they spray it with with herbicides to keep it a grassy monoculture um and so you know we could just dedicate a fraction of that space to sustainable food growing uh, for the community and it'd be a fantastic avenue for people to like go and do work placement at and like um, volunteer for the community and like there's just so many social elements that could integrate with that at the same time um yeah. I just, it's a crazy good idea yeah totally so yeah, we have the sort of spots yeah yeah go on like in Lismore, we have three cricket fields um, right next mm. to each other, and I'm like, I actually take my dogs walking down there. And like in yeah. in Kellyville and Sydney, when we lived down there, they actually turned one of the cricket fields into a dog park. It was amazing. Like to me, everyone just it was this huge big like this huge white palin fence cricket field, and there's so many dogs yeah. off leash. And like I thought that was amazing from the fact of it just brought so many people together, catching mm. up, that building that connection between humans. I think in Lismore as well, like the, the the dog park here is literally this tiny little 
on the river, mud fest. We, we don't take a dog. I actually take my dogs to the cricket field and walk around there uh, and let them off, <laughs> the off leash. So, um, but it is oh, you naughty three. boy. <laughs> so, um, that's all right. They got cameras everywhere. They probably watch me or we wave at them all the time. So, um, yeah, cool. Friends of the security. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's three. Um, yeah. There's three. And, and like, I think every time I think about it and go like, I've not once seen these three cricket fields filled at the same time. Like, why couldn't one of them be a, a dog field and a food forest and the other yeah. one be the sporting complex, you know, like, um, cause I've never seen three games of cricket all play there on the one time. So it's just like, and they just, it is, all I said is, is mowing them, maintain them. It's like, it's just yeah. a waste of energy, you know, Comes and they're, that, they're inherently a high They're like, and, and, Cricket pitches, lawn, whatever form it's in, it's inherently a high input system yeah. for what it gives you back. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. like, uh, you know, I, I don't have any lawn at my place, <laughs> um, but I do have massive amount of lawn over the road, which is where these some of these parks are. Um, and that's, I guess, gives me the privilege of, of lawn access while not having to maintain and, and inject my energy into such a, such a one-way system um yeah but yes i think less lawn is probably better for the the future sustainability of society if if possible if people can get away from the paradigm yeah um yeah food forest instead not get totally. into it yeah so <laughs> you know, like, for me, for, like yeah. with um with these new because most developers these days are doing between 200 to 300 houses in a property development Look, at the mm. end of the day, that's really a village, you know, like, you know, 150 people sort of around that, that you know, village design. And I think that's where I can see the, the biggest impact to be made. And that's why I want to really get involved in that industry and help with developing communities and, and doing those property developments. Because I see that you could make such a bigger difference if we had food forests and a lot more natural gardening and natural swimming pools in these community areas and make them more like a village like they used to be rather than these... You know, they just pick a corner. We'll put the trees over there and the greenery over there, and then just put everyone as close to, together as possible. In, in and you end up with this. One of the biggest things I see is, and being involved in a few developments, they whinge and moan about the water and the runoff and that sort of stuff there. And it's like, well, if everyone had water tanks, we didn't have so much concrete. We wouldn't have so much runoff. It could soak into the soil. It would leave the area slower, and you wouldn't have these flash flooding events that they're having. I think it's just. It's your logical Stored in theory. biomass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? It is it is quite odd, isn't it? Um yeah. and, and I think, yeah, it's it's like cost of build versus uh you're maximizing that profit is is kind of yeah. the driving force, isn't it? Um, which is it's probably one of the biggest problems with our society. <laughs> it sort of leads to a lot of poor decision making. Hundred mm. percent, yeah. I, I always say to people that you know we, we're trying to solve nature's problems with money, which is something we made up, you know, which it doesn't exist. At the end mm. of the day, money is something that it's a game we've made to play. And, you know, they're trying to solve nature's problems with something that's not real. So it's like, well, it's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, look, if, if it was simply used as an energy conservation, me energy exchange mechanism without the, uh, there's there's some elements of it that that allow sort of a an unfair kind of shifting of energy in that respect or a bundling of it um, in certain pockets I think is probably where things come unstuck in that if it was simply just an energy exchange mechanism it might not be as uh, insidious <laughs> yeah. but uh, unfortunately yeah the drive for more um, the drive for more is a big one. Yeah, that's it. unfortunate. Yeah. We locked in to a point, but yeah. <laughs> I, I strive against it at every point. <laughs> I really do. Totally. Maybe to so my I... detriment sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I uh, know that feeling. I know that feeling. So, yeah. Mate, so, so for me right now, I'm actually looking at my next off grid adventure, build my next property. And it's funny, it's like, on a daily basis, I give customers advice of, you know, right, I would do this, do that. And, you know, everyone seems to think it's really good advice, but I really struggle with, you know, if I was to do it for myself, you know, like, I'm like, oh, because I want to make sure, because, you know, it's all perfect. But so for you, what would your ideal setup be or living arrangement for off grid? If there was no barriers, what you want to do, what, um, mm. what would your ideal setup be? 
Well, it's funny. I'm I'm actually trying to uh, trying to make this happen at the moment, which is it's not an easy task. Um, but so I guess so. Most of my work is suburban, and that's it's kind of just where my money comes from for my business. And so I kind of just can't go out into the middle of nowhere and be fully off grid. And plus, I think I'd go a little crazy. As much as humans annoy me a lot of the time. Sorry, humans. Um, I. I do recognize the importance of community um, and like you can try and do everything yourself <laughs> and you're going to go crazy. I've tried, trust me, I went a little bit cuckoo, but um, yeah, so I think what I'm trying to get to is is a small uh, co-living situation and of course that's it's a little, councils don't like this much. Um, yeah. Um, there's, something needs to change though because the housing market is a, a real shit fight, excuse my my French. So um, basically, I'm looking to go in with some friends and get a larger semi-suburban property, something that's like, um, it's got enough growing space that we can have a bit of a food forest, um, chicken and veggie situation, try and try and basically cater for as many of our food and, and material needs as possible without uh, having multiple acres. And you can do a lot in a small space, a lot. Um, and so the idea would be to have, I mean, ideally, <laughs> as the question went, um, having multiple small abodes um, with growing space between them. So you're not rammed up against each other or on top of each other necessarily, but you have combined shared um, productive space and, and outdoor living space. Um, that is where I'm trying to go. Um, and it looks to me like I'm going to have to go in with a few people and try and build something appropriate because there's not a lot of places that are retrofitable to this level. Um, yeah. Having said that, I have a, a client at the moment who's sort of made a bit of a family compound uh, within suburbia in a similar, yep. that's a really weirdly big house that they bought and they're renovating three stories, um, three families from the same family, like mum, two daughters and their families yeah. um, combining. And they've got a really good size yard, um, which I've designed a big permaculture uh, system for them. And so they're going to be really well set up. It's sort of like I haven't seen better than that in this area so far. Yeah. So awesome. that's it's kind of the thing I'm looking at. Yeah. yeah. That would be ideal. In New Zealand, there's a um, a thing called the Block Party, and um, I'll find I've the heard link of this. Yeah, yeah, it's it's mm. pretty cool. The concept that's you know, I think it was like a thousand square meters. It wasn't huge, and they feel like nine families on there, and they literally did shared living spaces, um, and they just made like because it was more about the view that this had this big amazing view. But if one house got it, no one else got it, and they they did it that yeah. everyone's got their own little little thing, and then everyone can share the view, and it, it's amazing. I think. You know, I always think back to, you know, my thing is, okay, well, how, how things used to happen and with that multiple that levels, I think mm. what was really successful when families lived together, I think I look at cultures that really live together and there's families that really stick together and they all live together. And I think a lot of those places overseas internationally where they have the grandparents live in the granny flat downstairs and the younger family mm. there and they might have some other friends stand in another part of the house, but it's, it's, it is that finding the right group of people getting stuck together and doing yeah. things it's like they were talking before my mother-in-law she's got a 36 acre property it used to be 800 acres she's a cattle farmer and wow. she can't switch off the fact that you know for her to go away from the farm it, it's it's a i remember the, i think the the last time she had four weeks away we went and lived there for four weeks because she was freaking out and um so we went and spent four weeks <laughs> on the farm and had a bit of fun there and but it is that um yeah, without the community there, it feels like people can't go away. But if you're living together, have all these different people living together, it's really easy to go away because you get someone to look after the chickens. You don't even need to organize it. You yeah. You just go and there's someone already there, you know. Many hands uh, make light work. That's it. There's a reason a that's an adage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. Right. I think it's one of the it's biggest a... challenges. Like one of our customers recently, he's just sold um, 200 acres and gone back to 10 because of it's just a huge amount of work you have to look after. And, yeah, um, yeah. I think a lot of people don't, yeah, there's a lot of people want to go off grid and be self-sufficient in the middle of nowhere and just don't realize how hard of a job it is to manage 
or that acreage? Yeah, actually, I um, over the years of running the business, um, this is, I, I, I like to think it's funny, but it's also not, it's a bit worrying uh, if I... <laughs> So you get, you get a lot of people, they, um, you know, they, they listen to podcasts, they watch the TV shows or whatever, and they, they, they like, oh, no, I'm going to, my dream, I'm going to leave the city, I'm going to buy a property, um, I'm going to go from full-time work um, in, a, in an office to um, keeping livestock, I'm going to take my, my partner out there and my kids and they're going to love it, they better love it, <laughs> and like... Um, they agreed to this under threat of death. I don't know about that, but um, basically, like they all seemed happy enough, and um, and I, I sort of, you know, you, you help them set up um, and try and give them the most practical advice possible, and sort of try and uh, dispel some myths um, if possible. And then over the next, you know, three to five years, it might not take that long. Um, some harsh realizations start yeah. dawning. Um, and they're like, well, this is actually, I don't know if this is how I should have gone about this because I've isolated myself. I've, um, I've given myself like all of these things that I have to maintain in persistence. Um, even with permaculture, you know, uh, when animal lives need to be sort of catered for, um, and you don't have the mature systems to sort of do the hard yards for you. Um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of extra work that goes into the early phase of establishing these systems. And so, yeah. um, you know, having, having community that can share that load and share the produce when you've got like a massive bumper crop of something as well, all of that stuff is just so important, I think. Um, and I think it's frequently overlooked. So, yeah. um, that's definitely a message that I'd like to hammer home there. <laughs> I, I was starting to think, oh, uh, is it my fault these marriages are falling apart? I'm starting to see a pattern here. Like, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, swear maybe. I haven't been doing this, but yeah. yeah. It, it's so true. It's like we, we've had mm. several, you know, like several customers sell up, get divorced, um, go through that process yeah. um, just because, yeah, it, it was hard and it's tough. And yeah, yeah, I don't think people, yeah, people just don't realize how tough off grid living can be, you know? So I think it's, yeah. Yeah. it's not for everyone. You know? Yeah, and you know you gotta you gotta make sure that um, you know off grid, great. Um, off grid with some other people, so much better because yeah, yeah doing everything yourself as as I think I said, like um, I have a tendency to to try and do everything myself in the business, um, and I fight that. I'm fighting that now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because quite honestly, like uh, like some people like doing your books. I don't know what's wrong with them, but uh, <laughs> they they like it, and I I don't. And I was I've been trying to do it for years, and I'm like, this is murder for me. And if I just share this load, and like it applies to um, to everything in life, and, yep. and you know when it comes to producing your own food, to sharing resources, to sharing energy load, it's just it's a good way to go. But yeah, again, can be challenging, like everything. Yep. You got to get the right group of people get on the same page ethically and with your needs and, uh, you know, future desires, um, all that stuff should be talked about. Communication is important. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, big time. Yeah. Like it's uh, funny you say the communication. Like I, um, I do a communication <laughs> course every day, every year I attend a workshop. <laughs> Um, every day I was like, wow yeah. <laughs> well what is, this guy's really into communication <laughs> well, I, I am it, it, it's re yeah. a really important part of my life so uh, with everyone's life and i think mm. yeah. with the everyday thing i think people think you know they think because we talk every day they know how to communicate effectively and uh, there's mm. communities i've been involved in a lot of communities over, over the years of doing off-grid and even with with me of how i communicate with my customers i video when I when I do a quote, I video the whole thing. I, I've been in a situation before people say, Oh, you said this. I'm like, No, I didn't. Uh and I, I literally didn't <laughs> say that. And I go back and watch the video and I go, No, 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 this is what I said. Here's the video. Um, but yeah. what, what I, the reason I suppose the videos in my business, what I've done with the communication and stuff, is you know, because most of the time it is I speak to the husband and then the husband tells the wife a story, and then the wife's the one calling oh. yelling at me not doing it because something was miscommunicated. So I'm like, make sure everyone watches this video. Um, but look, communication is, yeah, like I so said, I do a course and it's 
one of those things that people think because they do it every single day, they know how to communicate. And mm. the first time my mate is my best mate who runs this communications course. And after doing the course, and it's funny, like you don't actually really, well, you don't talk. And a lot of people think you're going to do this course and talk. And it's, yeah, it's actually, you can't really explain this course without doing it. And it's the most powerful yeah. thing I've ever done in my life. You know, like without that course, um, Pretty confident, I probably wouldn't be in the marriage I'm in now. So, <laughs> it's, um, congratulations! Uh, yeah. Thank you. So, I, I think that course and, and it, it is a big thing, and that's you know communities where things go wrong, and yeah, communication is so important in everything we do in life. And I think people just don't give enough attention. Everything. Talk every day. Yeah. 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 So, talking is one thing. Talking and listening appropriately. There's, there's, it's, it's all of those things together. I think is, yeah. is the. Yeah, so you know, talking just talking at someone isn't communication. I'm afraid that's um, nah. and 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 of course it's more nuanced than that too. <laughs> but uh, yep. you know, without, without going into a communication podcast, um, <laughs> <laughs> it can be it's later. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's yeah, funny the, the, you mentioned that actually, with the um the the talking to the separate parts of the uh, relationship. Um, I quickly learned that you have to have all of them in one place. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the video idea is interesting. Um, yeah. So they can, they can even go back over it, but um, yeah. And you, yeah, but That's definitely uh, you, you want to, there, there have been times that I'll be like, guys, um, I'm giving you this advice combined, but it feels like you might need to go away and discuss this between <laughs> you and then come back to me. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah. I don't want to be in the middle of this right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, yeah get yeah. on the same page yeah. yeah and so you know just my wife and i now like it's funny like and i think a lot of things with you know and a lot of wives like my wife's amazing she would just follow me and do whatever i want to do and i'm I really check and say like is this something that you really want to do um because yeah she was like yeah let's just go let's do it whatever and i'm like is it really what you want to do and i think sometimes that happens in relationships where people don't speak up and and then you're doing mm. something you don't want to do and you know buying off grid property in the middle of nowhere and don't want to be there and lose all your friends and that connection. And yeah. so, yeah, it's, it's definitely something that people want to, um, yeah, inspect. <laughs> yeah. That's why you got to have in this line of work, you got to have an eye for the quieter one. Yeah. Um, and you have to bring, bring it to them yeah. every time. Yeah. yeah. Cause you don't want oh, them to be I, overridden or anything. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. It's, it's a, so important. Like, um, yeah, just asking questions and asking the right questions and getting clarity. And I think that's one of the biggest things where you go and you pitch your idea and your concept and people don't say anything. You're like, well, they said yes, go ahead. And there was enough questions asked. And then later on, it, you know, when it doesn't end up going so well, the right questions weren't asked, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mate, so yeah, it's been a great conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to add for listeners at home that you can recommend or advice that you'd give for someone that's, yeah, want to get this permaculture journey? Um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, don't pull back on the fiber, uh, a high fiber diet is really important. No, I'm kidding. Oh, that, that is important. Um, <laughs> that's not what I meant to say. Um, basically, um, look, if you are starting on this journey, um, what you want to be aware of is don't be afraid or like, don't, don't, don't try and take too much into your mouth in one go. So, as far as a um, little bit at a time, start small, work your way up. Um, if you try to do too much at once, then what you might find is you can you can get it can quite easy because okay, there's a lot there's a lot to focus on if you want to reach like full off grid uh, potential. And so again, like don't don't be afraid to just do a little. Um, you're better off doing a little than nothing. 100%. And if you want to go um, go big, uh, go big gradually, because um, I think, yeah, the prospect of you trying to get your head around all of the different elements you need to cover um, in a in one go is going to put a lot of pressure on you. So um, take this from someone who's easily overwhelmed, <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it's good permaculture practice too. You know, you start, uh, take, take a bite, manageable bites at a time, um, and, and, you know, consolidate and then, uh, take another bite, you know, and, and keep plotting on that way. 
Um, yeah, and and start with something you're especially interested in. I guess I would uh, would also. So it's like, you know, you'll get around to all of the elements eventually if you're if you're keen and and strong willed enough. Um, but you know, uh, you'll have more energy for the stuff that you have particular interest in. And so start there, you know, um, and that'll give you more juice to follow through with other stuff. Um, I reckon. Would you agree with that, Mike? I don't know. Yeah, no, totally. Like, like, <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Like for me, I um, you know, I had a business doing solar. Went did a permaculture course. Come back and thought I was going to take over the world, teaching people about permaculture, <laughs> artists, and been a designer, and and it just naturally like. We opened the house up in Sydney. We took a house off grid in the middle of Sydney. It has a demonstration site. And yeah. everyone come around to the house and was like, oh, this is great what you've done with your garden and growing all your own food. But what's this energy stuff over here? You know, and I was like, oh, let's not talk about that, you know? <laughs> and yeah. the, you know, I think I probably did like maybe three to five permaculture paid designs in my life. And then it was just solar. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah. I was interested. I love technology and it was my thing, you know, like it, it is so true. It's that, that interest. And I think, you know, yeah. like I've been doing this for, you know, over, well over a decade now and probably close to about 14 years as well. And I'm still so excited about all of it, you know, like it's just, it's yeah. yeah every day there's something new, something cool. And every day with yeah. a new project that comes across my desk, I'm like, I haven't done that before. Let's go. Let's look at that, you know, and um, yeah, it's good fun. Yeah. And that, that excitement, like it influences other people, right? Like if you can be passionate about something, um that that's infectious yeah. and so a big part of the education front is like if something doesn't really interest you that it's going to come through <laughs> yeah. but if you if you like um you know if i'm if i'm talking about food forests or insect hotels or you know natural pools or aquaponics whatever like people are get i'm going to be like dancing around a bit and people are going to be paying <laughs> yeah. attention because i'm dancing so yeah. that's it's a handy tool um and yeah, definitely. Well, you know, maybe it's it's our brain types as well. But I think all humans um, have this. Uh, you know, you're going to do. You're going to have more energy for the stuff that you're yep. you're particularly interested in. Yeah. No, and I the beauty of community, a... then. You know, different people have different interests, different fortes, different approaches, and so combining those things can make a really strong, cohesive community too. Totally. Know? Yeah. We 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 we're, we're yeah. looking at um. We're looking at getting involved in the community at the moment, like getting a block of land. And I, I'm not sending the emails because I don't want anything associated that know that I'm the solar guy. Um, yeah. Like, Can you do this and ask these questions and get this and get that. So, you know, I, I don't want my name associated with anywhere because they'll be like, oh, my God, solar guy. So you can look after all our solar <laughs> <laughs> No. Yeah, no, yeah. No, no. Hey, it's, it's more work, right? You, you want that? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're like, you're swamped, you know. <laughs> no it's, more, yeah, please. I think the the biggest thing I dread about, you know, me getting involved in the community and um because I'm not an electrician, it's not what I do, I'm not an installer, I just know, you know, mm. all about it. So um it is that, you know, when something goes wrong, they, they call you to fix it and it's always your weekend and there's that you just don't get that time. Oh off, yeah. You know? So um, Yeah, I get that. Yeah. yeah. You have to be strong. You have to say, look, you're probably not gonna get a message back on the weekend. <laughs> But I'm listening. Um, <laughs> I'm here for you, man. <laughs> yeah. It, it, so, um, it's Look, funny. running it, it, your own business, you you got to have strong boundaries sometimes. Yeah. No, totally, totally, totally. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. It's funny. I, I was actually going to another property the other day and um, customer had an issue. And it was like, it's funny the way the universe works. It's like, I'm literally driving past their place to have an issue. Otherwise, we said, no, nah, I'm not coming to help you with what it was. Yeah. But, uh, literally, I was driving past their place and it broke, you know. So I was like, you just wanted to see yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> nice. So, yeah, I try to. I don't know if it's good business practice, to be honest, but like, uh, this is how I work. So, um, I tend to tell people, look, as long as it's not an unreasonable level of it, once you've paid me for a site inspection or whatever, and I like, I, and you're a, a client, I'm happy to do text and email support for as long as you need it. Yeah, as long as it's not like. You know, on the weekend after like 6 p.m., um, 
or while I'm in the bath. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah, like, yeah. it's I need to have a degree of separation. But yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like yeah. that follow I mean, through is important, I think. Yeah. yeah. Well, one thing for me over the years I've really thought about for customers and um, like I think about myself and I, I'm guilty of it because you know, I, I always text people because, you know, I run a business, I'm flat out. You know, I, I try and take Fridays off to do personal stuff and business administration and, you know, do that paperwork none of us like doing. Um, oh, it never really ever gets horrible. done. But, but then I yeah. catch myself on the weekends going, okay, I've got to email that builder, text this guy, do that sort of stuff. I always <laughs> say, like, I know it's a weekend. I don't expect the response back till next week um, because, yeah, mate, it's, it's my time. I'm not doing anything else. And, yeah, so I, I, I know yeah. the pain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're a naughty boy. You're sending emails on the weekend. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You can't help yourself. Yeah. That's That's no. Awesome. Um, respite, I think, is is definitely something that people need to keep a, keep one eye on too. Yeah. We yeah. can't we can't be working six out six day weeks um, and expect ourselves to to be healthy. You know. No. That's it. Um, yeah. I'm that's it's not going to get you any closer. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Woo! I wish the government awesome. would be on board with that, but uh, <laughs> might be a while yet. Might be a while yet. <laughs> mandate yeah. it, but um, mandate it. So. Mandate it. Yeah, because because people love mandates. Um, <laughs> yeah. We've we've Man, noticed that over the last few years. I think you definitely get a vote through on that one, saying you know legally. Yeah, only four oh, if, yeah. <laughs> especially in Australia, uh, they'd be like, please, let's go. Yeah, no, gimme, awesome, gimme. Bro. No, that's it. So. <laughs> Mate, well, thank you. Yeah. I really appreciate your time. And uh, we'll put all Lockie's contact Not details in below so you can check it out when you get in contact with him. And, Mate, thank you. And we'll talk to you next time. Yeah, good to meet you, Mike. Thanks for having me. Thanks, mate. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found the content educational and inspiring. If you got something out of it and you think you know someone else that would actually also enjoy it, we'd really appreciate it if you could share the link with them and encourage them to check out our channel. And don't forget you can join the Off Grid Tribe podcast for free. We can actually ask and interact with myself and also our guest speakers. So jump over today to theoffgridtribe.com, register yourself an account. We can actually have a conversation with myself and one of our guest speakers and we can continue the conversation there. Together, let's embrace the power of sustainable living.